Well, it can get to be a kind of a definitional problem, but it is the, um, the project, it is essentially the fantasy projection onto another uh, that they make up for your lack, uh, that they can finally, through their, their utter uh, openness to reception of your fantasy, give you back that which you can never have out of your own splitness. You know, I, I mean that by unconditional love. Um, and I mean that people do treat animals that way. Um, they treat other people that way too. But there seems to be a kind of broad permission, witness the, the description of infantilization that, that this man witnessed. There seems to be kind of a broad permission to treat animals that way that I would like to withdraw. <laughs> what about Levinas? Uh, yeah. Levinas and his, his definition of ethics as something which has no condition. You give everything and you don't cannot expect anything back. And he doesn't mm -hmm. call it unconditional well, love, a, but it yeah. has a structure. It's, it's, a, it's a changed meaning of the word condition. Uh, um. Asymmetric, totally asymmetric. And if the other way around, the more uh, the other is weak, so to speak, it's not, has not your power, the more it's a call to you to respond in an ethical terms. And that would, animal in some way, would have this quality of uh, that we could destroy them. They hardly can destroy us anymore, then therefore we are inclined not to do it at all. I think we certainly have a different kind of obligation uh, to those over whom we have that kind of power compared to peers. On the other hand, there are ways in which dogs are strong in relation to us, sure. too. So it's not utterly in that, no, no. In that direction. Um, and I think that um, there's a part of the manifesto I wrote uh, rooted in um, uh, Philip Ackersley, uh, Ackerley's book, My Dog Tula, where I talked about the difference between um, looking for unconditional love for another, the difference from uh, what I regard the, that essentially pathological move, expecting unconditional love from another, okay, as opposed to seeking to fulfill uh, the, you know, when in love with another, asking who are you and then um, seeking to meet that, to meet um, the requirement of that growing knowledge. Ackersley relates with this, this dog tulip in this story. It's a really interesting way, also quite comical. It's a kind of, um, I mean, you know, here's Ackersley, this famous writer, homosexual, so who, who does he end up with in life but a, a, a you know, a rehomed uh, Alsatian bitch, not necessarily his ideal love object. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And it follows this extraordinary life story of his uh, turning heaven and earth to somehow give her the life that he thinks she ought to have. Well, I think he is actually enacting unconditional love in a kind of Levinas-esque sense. He is not asking it from her or projecting his fantasy onto her, and it's tragicomic. I think any kind of relationship of that kind is tragicomic. Because um, <laughs> uh, you're always in love with the wrong object. <laughs> you know, and it doesn't matter because that's the object who's, you know, that <laughs> you act like Ackersley did to Tulip. <laughs> I'm not particularly afraid of uh, biological accounts of human beings of all sorts. I find them rather enriching and sort of yet another thread in the fabric. They don't seem to me to, to displace other accounts, to invalidate them. Um, it seems to me that biological and biobehavioral accounts of human beings are a, a really interesting set of inquiries. I think they are often done, often done with a heavy ideological load. I think standards of evidence are often really kind of shocking. Mm -hmm. uh, in areas that are so loaded uh, with um, various kinds of political meanings, it seems to me standards of evidence ought to be particularly high, and yet we find them particularly low. That's kind of a bad idea. Um, but on the other hand, I would love to see um, well done and uh, you know seriously engaged biobehavioral evolutionary biological inquiry into us as yet another fabric a strand in the fabric. Most folks are afraid of it. I think in part because of the extremely heavy um, ideological um, job that has been done on uh, questions of class and race and other natural natural subordination and on and on. I think the, the um, available scientific work with some really interesting exceptions, has been uh, pretty shitty. And, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think the best, the, best the best that I've seen out of that is, you know, studies made of, you know, college women 
you know, living in the same dorm, the same space, and they're all menstruating at the same time. Yeah, well, they're, yeah, I know what you mean, but yeah, that's about kind of the general, I think the general point is, yeah, I think there's, I think is a perfectly legitimate domain of inquiry, and I think it's um, a very hard one to do uh, in the context of the history of the inquiries. Human, non-human, various forms of organic life, uh, machining, landscape, built. Uh, I think that the, the um, agencies are frequently not human, uh, that we, there are all sorts of agencies in the world that ought not be thought anthropomorphically, including our own frequently, uh, but that there are all sorts of concatenated semiotic material relationship uh, and plant-human and plant -human relationships are extremely important, including on that, you can't exactly say face-to-face, -face. what would you say, face to chloroplast? I'm not sure, face to needle? Uh, <laughs> what's the right scale? In any case, there's a one-on-one -on -one relationship to the individual bonsai, right? But there's also a whole extraordinary history of, of our species in relationship to um, the botanical world, not only food plants, but certainly also including food plants. Um, this room, by the way, is one botanical marvel. Breed, breed, um, breed club culture is a very vibrant, contemporary domain of eugenic discourse. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons that I got into the dog stuff, actually, was to try to see what I thought about the similarity and dissimilarity between um, eugenic discourses in dog land and uh, eugenic discourses in human land uh, and other racial discourses, not necessarily eugenic ones, because I wanted a kind of oblique take because I knew they didn't map onto each other one to one, and I and I wanted uh, to to get a handle on this issue. And I and frankly, I'm still muddling through it. Um, there's no question in my mind that the uh, lay culture of breed clubs has inherited uh, blood doctrines, uh, breed doctrines, eugenic doctrines out of 19th century practice, and have held on to them firmly. And uh, they're interestingly kind of a mixed with uh, biotechnological discourses, you know, g uh, DNA tests for this and that, uh, mandatory DNA tests and to get your public puppies registered with the AKC, for example. Really interesting mixes of um, enduring old discourses and recent new discourses around questions of, of goodness of breed, goodness of kind, and then the meaning of kind. It's a very, it's a very uh, heterogeneous set of practices, and it does not map onto human racial discourses um, very, certainly not, you know, there's, there's all kinds of blurring when you try to map them onto each other. Um, there are a fair number of folks in dog land, uh, in, in, among which I include myself, who, who feel, you know, get on email discussion lists and so on and so forth, and then try to convince people um, to use categories like populations. You know, it's the old work that people did during the period of the UNESCO statements, to substitute terms like population for terms like race for biologically meaningful units. And breeders say some really interesting things. Uh, my lines aren't a population. And a, 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 the, there, there's this really interesting uh, different use of words where people understand population to be the sort of technical term that experts use and that can't possibly apply to their group of breeding animals. Um, so there's, there's this phenomenon that um, my social world's uh, friends, people like Lee Starr and, and Adele Clark and Joan Fujimori and others have taught me to notice the way words function as boundary objects among different communities of practice. You may appear to be using the same words, but they actually have quite different definitions and do different work inside the discourses. Words like breed and population and blood and gene do that um, in dog land, and I'm finding it kind of a, an interesting place that I haven't finished mapping. Yes. So which means that any attempt to spell out an, an ethics would have to begin from the premise that of our radical in, in, in non-self-sufficiency. That's right. Our radical, we are radically relational. Yeah. But one word we are coming back to, to the community. Huh? Yeah. But is the community not of humans alone, but the communities with all the others who made us human. And we always accepted it for other people, that we need other people to become human. Like we need your bacteria. Right.